Hello and welcome to Series 5 of Crisis What Crisis. I'm Andy Coulson, a former newspaper editor, Downing Street Director of Communications and one-time inmate of HMP Belmarsh. Over the last seven years, I've put all of my experience, the good and the bad, to use as a strategic advisor to business leaders. And I can tell you that the bad has been just as useful as the good. And that got me thinking that there are plenty of great podcasts out there where you can hear stories of success, but there are far, far fewer where you can benefit from the experiences of those whose lives have properly unraveled. So on this podcast, you'll hear from the embattled, shamed, courageous, ruined, damaged, resilient, unlucky and lucky survivors of crisis. But you'll also hear from renowned crisis managers, mental health experts and other advisors who were in the room when major crises have hit. All of them offering useful, practical coping techniques and tips and all with the straightforward aim of guiding you towards a more resilient approach to life and whatever it might throw at you. Crisis What Crisis is generously supported by Mindstream, a brilliant company who harness the power of music for personal well-being and improving human performance. Just search for Mindstream, that's Mind with a Y, on Spotify, and you'll find some great playlists. And if you enjoy what you hear on this podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating and review. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Our handle is at Crisis What Crisis Podcast. Welcome back to Crisis What Crisis and our first episode of 2022. I'm chuffed to bits that I'm joined today by someone who, although they didn't know it, helped me navigate some dramas in my life, um, along with uh, hundreds of thousands of others. Professor Steve Peters is a consultant psychiatrist who specialises in the functioning of the human mind. And his landmark book, The Chimp Paradox, has become a Bible for anyone looking to overcome crisis or to simply understand and beat the barriers that prevent us from living a fuller, happier life. He's done that for people from all sorts of backgrounds, for all sorts of reasons, including a long list of athletes, most famously the British cycling team. Steve started out as a teacher and worked in the NHS for two decades as a GP and later as a forensic psychiatrist at High Security Rampton Hospital. He holds an endless list of qualifications in medicine, mathematics, education, sports medicine and psychiatry. Um, He's published a number of best-selling books, as I say, including most recently A Path Through the Jungle. But it's the brilliant chimp paradox that gave Steve rock star status as a psychiatrist. For those of you who haven't read it, it sets out a mind management approach, a system really based on the premise that there are three forces at play in our brains. The emotional and primal inner chimp thinks and acts for us without our permission. The inner human is the real person, is you, rational, compassionate and humane. And our memory bank is the computer. For me, it's been a powerful, entirely logical and frankly, bloody useful toolkit for handling stress and those moments of difficulty. Um, In our chat, Steve talks about how the chimp system Uh, applies itself if you like to crisis and how it can help anyone kids included uh, navigate a world increasingly driven by those black and white judgments of social media so it's a different kind of podcast than usual this week a fascinating analysis of what crisis is how our brains work when we're in the midst of significant trouble and the importance of values acceptance and perspective Uh, It's a chat full of gems that I guarantee you will want to make a note of. So get your pen or if you're anything like me, your notes app ready. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. And thanks, as always, for listening. Professor Steve Peters, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank Uh, you for inviting me. uh, I'm a uh, unashamed uh, big fan of the chimp paradox, and I've been looking forward to this conversation enormously. Um, but before we get into your work, Steve, and your and your model that's been so successful in helping so many people, I'd like to talk um, just a little bit about you, if I may. Um, you're the you're the son of a dock worker, and your mum uh, was an insurance agent, I think, uh, born in Middlesbrough. So there are no silver spoons in this story. Um, you're a very bright lad, the first boy in your school to take four A levels. Uh, university followed and your first professional role in life was as a maths teacher is that right that's correct that's correct how was that first job I mean uh, I'm obviously very intrigued to 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 discuss the the kind of incredible journey that you've had to 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 where you are now but but what do you what do you remember about that that early life fantastic time I mean 
at the end of the day, when I came to go to university, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to be a vet. Uh, that right. was the original thoughts. Then I thought, really, if I'm going to be a vet, I really should focus on people and be a doctor. But I, I loved actually teaching. And so I, I found math straightforward. So I decided maybe I should do a degree in maths and, uh, and get into the classroom. So and that I did. And, and I taught for a few years. Um, what happened was I was doing a lot of voluntary work um, as a young man. So I worked with the uh, Help the Aged, NSPCC. Uh, I was working at a place called North Sea Camp with uh, detained young men who got into difficulties. Yes. So I was doing a lot of charitable work and I helped set up the victim support scheme. It didn't exist then. So I was lucky enough to work with a senior probation officer who asked me to join him and, and work on helping people who've been victims of crime. And that was really eye-opening. And so I, after a short time of teaching... I just thought, really, I wanted to help people uh, because there seemed to be so many psychological and medical problems in the work I was doing that I felt I really needed that knowledge in it to be able to help people. Mm -hmm. So I went back to medical school, retrained, and then entered the medical profession as a doctor. So where did the where did the sort of energy come from in in in, in your uh, in in your life? I mean, it's it, you, you know your your story is. Is one of um, re remarkable success, sort of breakneck activity, and and to a degree, some sort of reinvention as well. Um, uh, you know, I, you, you touched on some of the roles there. I mentioned them in the intro. The qualifications gained, you know, the millions of books sold. You've you've also been a successful age group athlete, holding several world records. I think that, that that's it. We've got a lot of energy. Um, but the, the running was just incidental. It's only a fun thing and it, it's worth doing. I've done it 30 years and I didn't realise I could really sprint that hard. And it was only when I got to 40 that people said, you're doing well for an old man. Uh, and uh, so I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll stop now. And then they said, oh, there's this master's world of athletics. So I, I did start hitting the gym and training properly. And, and then I just realised I got to the top and I was getting these world records and I've been there for a privilege of being there for 30 years, but it's very hard work staying there. Um, but I think yes. the initial energy, where it comes from, um, I think it's a gift to me that I'm blessed by finding success in other people. I, I love seeing people succeed. I love to help the underdog. I love to maximise performance in people, not just in sport, because that's a, sort of a sideline, really. It's in, in their quality of life. I love to get people off the floor and work with them to to get success in the life and good self-esteem, that's always been my driving force. So problem solve, you know, mm. couple of solutions. Mm. I suppose my question is, is, you know, is anchored around the, the, the fact that you've, you, you wrote the chimp paradox in what, sort of 2011, 2012, there or thereabouts, mm. um, by which time you'd achieved, you know, so much. So you clearly had a, a firm grip on your mind and how to get the best out of it from a very early stage. I mean, did I think, you work? Did you work that stuff out for yourself? Did you in, did you get inspiration from from other places and from I don't know another book or or other people that you were working with, or is it, or maybe maybe it's genetic, maybe, or maybe it's it's kind of from your parents. I don't know. I mean, I'm interested to know where the foundations for all this were built. I think I've always been a bit of a dynamo in the sense of having a lot of energy and loving to live life to the full. Uh, coupled with the idea that I said, I love helping people. I'm a real people person. I think the combination means you're directing the energy at helping people and that feeds itself. You know, the rewards of seeing people in a good place uh, just feed mm. you with more energy. So I absolutely love what I do. Um, I'm not stopped doing it. Uh, I think from the chin point of view, when I became a doctor, I was never going to be a psychiatrist. That wasn't on the cards. Um, and I do remember doing cardiology at one point, And I remember one of the uh, other doctors saying to me, a psychiatrist, this was, he came to visit. Someone had done an overdose and we were stabilizing the arrhythmias they'd created in the heart. And he said to me, you know, you're really good with people. You really should be a psychiatrist. And I remember thinking, no chance. Uh, I just didn't rate it. I just kept thinking, I'm not sure why it's medical. It's you just ch chat to people. Mm. Uh, I think the turning point came when I trained as a GP. I left hospital medicine, went into general practice. And during that, in my rotations, I did psychiatry. And I think it really bowled me over because it was at that point I realized it was highly academic. It probably the hardest of the sciences because you really have to work out what's going on in someone's head and have the medical knowledge and the neuroscience 
to back up what your ideas are on this particular person. And you've got to work and communicate really well with them. So I found psychiatry was one of these things where to be good, you really have to be good. And it was a challenge. And it was coupled with the fact that the most vulnerable people were sat in front of me at that point. This is a long time ago and over 30 years ago that I just felt the service was so poor in what it supplied to help people. I couldn't walk away. I just couldn't mm. walk away. And I thought I'll stay on and do another six months and another. Uh, and it really just, I just stayed and kept going, uh, working through disciplines and became a consultant almost by accident. Um, and absolutely love my job. Uh, the difficulty was that when people came through the door, and this is leading to your question on the chimp uh, model, um, what I found is there's a temptation as a doctor to pick up a prescription pad as soon as somebody walks in, because generally speaking, if we're going to treat people, that's one of the main ways we would do it. Uh, but in psychiatry, and my opinion was, and in my opinion, maybe half the people coming through the door did not need medication. They needed to understand what was going on in their lives and particularly in their mind. So I started to really get interested in the neuroscience of the mind uh, and also looked at the brilliant people that had gone before, such as Freud, uh, Klein, Jung. So these were the uh, psychodynamic aspects, psychoanalytical, but also like obviously um, Ellis's rational emotive therapy, Beck came in. I looked at transactional analysis and being an academic at university, I teach all these things. So I, I'm teaching all these theories and therapies and, and it became Something that suddenly struck me is none of them were actually saying to you, your mind can think, you know, without you. None of them were really saying that to me. They were always saying, like, you've thought this uh, and this is a defense or this is. And I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying from my point of view, I tried to link that to neuroscience. And it became obvious in neuroscience that parts of our brain operated both thinking and behaviorally without our permission. And the more I researched that, the more I realized that uh, there are two of us operating. And it made sense then when patients come in and say, I'm drinking too much, but I don't want to do this. And it made sense why people get anxious and can't just flick a switch and say, well, I'm going to stop now. So all these things started to become apparent. And I tried to explain this to my medical students. I'm at Sheffield Medical School and explain to them, you know, you've got to look at this part of the brain and separate it from the person in front of you. They're dealing with a machine, just like we do with our liver that does what it wants, our kidneys that do what they want. We only know when they're going wrong and we get symptoms. The problem with the mind is it seemed to be dysfunctioning a lot of the time and creating a lot of stress to people. Mm. So I invented the chimp model in the 1990s, and it was an attempt to unify all of these amazing building blocks that I had been taught and I'd learned and been using. Uh, such as things like CBT, um, and bring them together with this added ingredient that says, don't forget this part of your brain that's not within your control. Uh, and, and that was the start. So it's been around for 30 years nearly. Uh, I taught it to students in the hope that they would use it themselves and help patients. Uh, but it it just got a life of its own, and I was worried it would become a cult. Um and I called it the inner chimp because talking to hominid specialists, he's the great ape specialist, they were saying that the chimpanzee alone in, within the hominid group operates the same way as we do with the brain. And it's the same system. It's almost identical. So this particular system, um, I said that we have that in our heads. So it's like having this little inner chimp. Mm. And people found it amusing, but very powerful. So obviously after that, I got challenged quite rightly heavily by students say, is this accurate? Is this scientific? So I had to start to explain it in terms of neuroscience. So it took a life of its own. And in the early 2000s, I finished the model and said, you know, it, it's an accessible model. If it resonates with you, it's not for everyone. Yeah. Uh, and then it catapulted me into the limelight. Let's just take a step back then uh, and explain the framework in, in, in a little bit more detail, if you don't mind, because it is the, essentially the framework for our, our conversation today. Yes. In, in, in summary, you identified that there are effectively sort of three voices vying for attention in the brain, if you like. Um, our chimp, which you know is in evolutionary terms the most established, possibly the loudest. Uh, our human uh, and what you call our computer. Just explain to us, um, uh, uh, if you don't mind, Steve, how these three elements come together to help, but also uh, in, a, in the context of crisis, if you like, how they hinder us. Okay, so 
in a nutshell, to try and keep this simplified so we can access the brain and use it, what you see is there is the orbital frontal cortex, a bit of the brain above the eyes. Uh, it thinks and acts in a very impulsive way. So this is the chimp system. And it taps into the centre of the brain and calls on the brain. It's like an orchestra playing away. And depending on what music they're asked to play, different parts play loudest. But the chimp interprets all of that internally with what's external to it. And it does that from its emotions. So this part of our brain goes on feelings, intuition, body language. It's very much an emotionally based part of our brain. It does use logic, but it's based on emotion before it forms an action. What happened is that system gets going in early, uh, the early weeks of fetal life. We see this developing and reacting. So it reacts to life and it works out what works and what doesn't. It's very reactive, yes or no. Um, what we find is around the age of two, a second thinking and interpreting system develops and starts to question with logic as a basis. So we have these two systems. They're not opposing, but they can collide because they interpret differently and they have different agendas. As you rightly said, a primitive chimp system is a defense mechanism to make us survive and perpetuate the species. Whereas our human system, which is the dorsolateral area of the brain, the top of the head, when this starts to develop, it's more inclined to use values uh, and look at things such as perspective to try and say, how do I see the world? And let's put things into context. The chimp brain can't do that. It's not possible when we operate with that system to get context. So that's why we often feel when we go into this emotional state and we see the brain lighting up using the chimp system, we overreact, uh, we lose perspective, uh, and we tend to regret often what we've done later on. With the human system, because it comes in secondary, it's not very powerful. So the chimp has the ability to freeze, knock out, influence heavily the way we see logic. So often we know what needs to be done, but our chimp brain won't allow it. It goes on emotion. So you have these two systems which can be opposing our work together. The computer system is really the center of the brain, which is, as I explained, like an orchestra. They're like instruments that both of them can use, but they can both influence those instruments. So they tell them what tune to play. So the middle of the brain is a computer system which has not got an agenda. It's just saying, program me. Program your experiences, your interpretation, your beliefs, your values. And whatever you do, I will feed these back to you as a reminder. So that was the basis of the model. Two thinking, interpreting parts of the brain, tapping into the entire brain and leading on how they see the world and what their agenda is. Mm. And they can often be similar or very disparate. And then the middle of the brain, just simplifying it as being a massively complex computer system, which supports either of them depending on which one you want to use. Hmm. But we have to then tidy the computer up regularly if our chimp brain puts in silly thoughts or silly feelings that are destructive or unhelpful beliefs, which will then influence the way we operate. So the, con the context of our conversation today is, is not entirely, but largely crisis. Yeah. You, you, might, you might argue that in crisis, the chimp is probably more helpful or can be more helpful and it can be unhelpful, at least at least if you're at the sharp end of a visceral crisis. We've had guests on this podcast, one guest in particular who went through the most appalling and traumatic kind of you know flip of a coin in her life when a, when a, a boat that she and her family were in uh, and was thrown out and uh, her husband and one of her children killed uh, pretty much instantly. She lost a leg. You know, a, a, about as visceral and brutal a moment of crisis as you can imagine. What got her through that, at least in the in the immediacy of it, presumably was the chimp kicking in with the survival instinct and mm. the and the ability just to keep just to keep going, uh, rather than to try and find perspective or rationalise, which I assume would have would have you'd agree would have sent her backwards. Yeah, I mean, I tried to put this across by giving the title "The Chimp Paradox" because I kept saying it's on the cover. It's the best friend you'll ever have. So in crisis situations, it will, it will support us. That's its job to get us out of danger. It may not use logic, but it uses what it knows works primitively with instincts and behaviours it's learned. Mm. So it will kick in. And I keep saying it is your best friend. The reason that I think people read the chimp paradox and see it as being the enemy is because it can also be extremely destructive. Mm. 
in cases of crisis, the problem the chimp will have, it may get through the crisis, but then it struggles to process what happened. So then it has the emotional turmoil, often leads to things like PTSD, uh, where it can't process the reality of the situation because it doesn't work with reality. It can't. Mm. Mm. It works with what should be in life. So therefore it leads the chimp to become frustrated, angry, upset. So these are what we see when people can't process information because their chimp brain won't allow it because it keeps on saying it should not have happened. Whereas when we flick into the human brain, we're saying, well, it did happen. Let's start with reality and go forward. The, the, the danger is that we either address one or other system instead of both systems. So we have to be realistic and say, let's look with what's factual and come to accept that. But at the same time, we have to work with the emotional processing of the brain. And we know the chimp system roughly, as a rule of thumb, takes around 12 weeks to process a traumatic event just by running through stages. And that can extend to years or it can be slightly shorter. But certainly in all of us, we go through these almost a grief reaction or a processing stage that we have to follow. That's the way the brain works. A bit like a broken leg healing. It's going to take three months, Mm. you know, six weeks to really heal and six weeks to strengthen. Mm. And it looks like the mind does something similar. Six weeks where it's very painful and broken and hurting. And then it has a repair system starting up. And around three months, it starts to organize again to start going forward that's but, interesting that's yeah. really interesting sorry, sorry to cut in so yeah. if in crisis that would lead you to conclude that you know don't don't, don't try and find you know the, the 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 solution don't try and find you know the, okay. the, the or define the path through your problem until you're three months in yeah i mean i used to joke with i um, was undergraduate dean at Sheffield uh, and the students used to come and see me and, I, and it was often a break of a relationship, which I know can be extremely traumatic and it is very painful for anybody. And so my heart went out to them, but I used to say, look, I've taught you this. When are you going to recover? So if it happened now, I would say, right, December, January, February, March. In March, come back and see me and then we can talk sense. Really? You'd be that definitive yeah. about it? And yeah. They all knew. What's the, what's, the, what's the science there, Steve? How, how did you get to the kind of, you know, 12 weeks? Well, you look at how, if you look at experientially, when we look at grief reactions in people, we, we recognize stages and, and experts in this will explain that not everyone experiences them, but we recognize stages such as anger because this is unacceptance. So if you now look at the scanning of the brain during anger, you'll see the chimp system lighting up. Hmm. So we, could, we know this is the chimp system now, the orbital frontal areas joining with another group of structures in the brain, aren't letting go. That system flicks across into bargaining and yearning, if only, if only. And I'm sure the horrendous uh, incident for your the, the person you interviewed previously on the board, she may have gone through this where there's a lot of frustration and anger, then the bargain, it only we hadn't gone out that day, it only this, we, we need to do that, the chimp needs to do that. The humans, the human brain doesn't. So the human brain can accept it's happened, the problem is we're not just human. We are human and chimp. Mm. We are emotionally based creatures. Our brain is emotionally based. So we have to work with that. So we then see usually um, a disorganized stage coming in under grief where the reality is dawning now. And we see the chimp system beginning to accept this. So that's how the neuroscience starts to marry in with the experiences people have. And we all get these experiences even with a relationship breakup, we bargain. If you do this, if I do that, what if? And we, until we come to the point we realise it's over. And then we have this horrendous drop where we feel like the end of the world has happened because the reality's hit. There is no way forward. Mm -hmm. But we also know, given time, when we know this, time is a healer. What the brain is doing is, and, and Freud said this, during sleep, we have an interaction between the chimp and human brains and the computer. So the brain becomes very active in some parts of sleep where it's processing what's happening. And, and in my model, the human is now talking to the chimp and saying, look, it's happened, you know, and we've got to move on. And we see this happening unconsciously along with the computer coming in, reassuring the chimp and saying, you know, things will get better and showing experience in life where it does. That's why often when we go to sleep and we wake up, we feel different. We say, let me sleep on it. Because what happens is our chimp has to listen. <laughs> it communicates to our human during sleep. And we wake up and say, do you know what? I feel slightly different about it. 
So yeah. we know that that's how the brain processes information. Steve, one of the many roles you've had um, saw you working at Rampton High Security Hospital, um, working with patients with very significant psychiatric problems, an institution, if you like, full of crisis. Yes. Uh, t- tell me a bit about that work and, and tell me what it, what, it, what it showed you, what it demonstrated to you about how the mind works when in crisis. Yeah, I mean... Or, or I, was, I should I should add, by the way, not just when in crisis, but when a mind has frankly created. Yeah, crisis. I think yeah. that's probably more like it. Yeah. I mean, again, Rampton, Rampton is a big hospital. It's a secure hospital. Uh, I worked in one of the divisions within Rampton. So my work was specific and that was in the field with uh, men who had transgressed the law, often may have killed somebody and um we're now held as dissocial personality disorders under the law. So colloquially, people may classify as psychopathic yes. individuals. So for me, um, I think... You're working, you were working one-to-one with these people. Yes. Uh, this is obviously under the Home Office, so I can't give any details. Oh, cool. Of course, um, yeah. but, uh, what I can say is that what it did for me was a sad truth that changed. I had actually believed for a long time... Uh, that, you know, with care and affection, anyone can get the best out of themselves uh, and be a productive member of society. I'm afraid the neuroscience didn't back me. And I thought that until I worked there and realised that some people's brains uh, are not wired the same as us and they do not have compassion or empathy. So no matter how much you might reach out to them and try and get them uh, to see, they don't have a conscience. So it's really not the way to work forward with these people. They work much more on a behavioural structure. And that was a sad moment for me because I I just would love human beings to be nice to each other and and have a happy world. But Do you remember that? Do you remember the, well, was there a sort of a a, a final moment of of surrendering on that? Or was it a gradual process? I mean, It was gradual. I fought it all the way thinking, no. Because again, I mean, some of the guys in there have have committed horrendous crimes, but they do actually get crisis. If they do have a conscience, you wake that up by reaching out to them and they will fall apart. So it's not unusual to find them falling apart within there. And then you realise this is not someone who is a a dissocial personality disorder. This is someone who actually... Is, is a damaged individual that's created a lot of havoc. I'm not saying they're accountable, um, but they have remorse. Um, but I'm just saying there were guys there who had no remorse whatsoever and no empathy, and no compassion. And that was a sad moment to realise. But, but it was confirmed for me by looking at the work done on psychopathic individuals, where we see one particular structure in the brain, <clears throat> which is very different to the rest of us. Uh, so it's not structured the same in our brain. It's a single tracked pathway. It, it's quite wide and it has lots of interconnections. And in the dissocial brain, it's very small and has no interconnections. And for some reason, we don't know how this presents with a, a conscience to the individual. Uh, and there were other areas of empathy that did not function. They were absent or, or not functioning mm. at all. So, so yeah. It was, how, it was, how recently have we been able to be that sort of specific? uh from a from the mapping of someone's brain i mean is that is that is that a relatively recent uh, innovation within the criminal justice system if you like i don't think it is recent no i think um it's been a transition again where we've always got to be careful as doctors and as researchers to say that we found this we need to really make sure we're right here because you can imagine how damning that is if we get Mm. it wrong and we think Mm. oh wow now we've done a lot of studies on this it's not holding at all Mm. and the awful thing is if i were to scan somebody's brain and say oh there's a small track that must be there for a dissocial personality uh, and they're not at all so we have to be very careful uh, but I think now over many years, this has been around a long time now, uh, I think we're pretty convinced that, you know, when you get someone who has not got these areas of compassion or empathy or moral conscience, that you need to work with them in a different way. Uh, yeah. It's much more about consequences of action. More broadly, though, outside of an of a institution like Rampton, when you look at prisons uh, more, more generally, is, do you hold to the view that we are, uh, uh, do, whatever your sort of moral view on it, on, on you know, criminal justice, do, do you hold to the view that it just makes sense for us to better understand and support the mind of people who end up in prison outside of those extremes that you've just described? Yeah. I mean, they, they were obviously extreme, extreme. Yeah. 
uh, these are very dangerous people. It was known as dangerous and severe personality disorders. So yes, of course. Um, yeah, but for the general for the general prison population. Yeah, which I, I worked about obviously, I did, how we approach work. the mind. Yeah, I did work in prisons as well uh, when I was general adult psychiatrist, and that led on to Rampton. Mm. Um, so covering that, yeah, I think everyone is unique to me. Everyone is unique, and some people uh, inherently have no values or morals, uh, and they will stick with that. Uh, but it's a spectrum. Uh, so a lot of guys or women who are in prison, if you reach out, the, my experience, it's only my experiences, they're often very damaged individuals or people who've made serious errors and then don't know how to get out of it. Hmm. So it's, it's a track that leads nowhere. And we've got to get intervention to salvage the people who are able to get back on their feet and get out and be productive uh, and help those who need support. I don't, I don't have this belief that everyone can be independent. I think some of us need support uh, and we need to provide that support, particularly in crisis when uh, the chimp brain can take over. It's brilliant to have someone to fall back to. So if we have a support network for these people and I've seen that working uh, and it's very good but also use discretion that we still have to sift out those individuals who will be wasting our time with. Um, but this is only my opinion. My, mm. my approach is always the same. that I, I try and treat everybody as if they're salvageable to get them back on their feet and get them in a great place that so have confidence, self-esteem. That is always my start. And then as I fail to do that, or we fail to work together, you start to compromise and say, okay, what's realistic now? Yeah. Uh, crisis is a word that gets thrown around an awful lot these days um, especially in public life um, from a from a neurological point of view what constitutes crisis in your view this is where it gets difficult because you know whenever I've done like interviews on radio television whatever people or magazines they always say give us five tips for our readers and I can't do this and the reason that I can't and won't be drawn is we are unique individuals. So a crisis to one person is not a crisis to another. Mm. So you've got to put it within the setting. <clears throat> so if you have, for example, somebody loses their house, they can't pay the mortgage. Many people would just take a deep breath and say, okay, we start again or we'll do this. And it's not a crisis to them. It really isn't. It's just, well, it happens. Whereas other people can be absolutely destroyed by that event. And the same with relationship breakups. You know, if you're in a relationship and your partner is unfaithful and you find out some people, it can damage them for life. They're, they're what I call emotional scars. Whereas others just seem to get over it and think, you know, I'll move on. But the same person who gets over it and moves on may find that they've lost a position at work that they felt they deserved and an injustice happened and they can't get over that. So we are unique to what constitutes a crisis. Um, and we're on a spectrum. Clearly, for most of us, losing our home or losing a partner would be a, a crisis of some kind. We'd certainly feel emotional people, most of us. But my feeling, the way I operate is I need to hear it from the person. What is the thing that's causing the crisis in their eyes? Is it that they feel let down by someone who was unfaithful? Is it that they feel they're going to be alone for the rest of their life? Is it that they never get confidence to get another relationship? So it's very important to look at what's underneath the crisis to determine why they're interpreted as a crisis. Mm -hmm. Professionally, I've sort of sort of wondered about this. You know, I, I do a bit of work around crisis management, yeah. among other things. And, and, and the closest I could get to it was really it's, it's a crisis if you feel that the course of your life is no longer in your control, right, that you've... Yeah. You've lost control of the of the of the direction, you know, the, the desired direction of your life, and that can be something quite small, can't it? You know, that can be a relationship breakdown, or it can be it can be a, a you know a complete unraveling at the at the highest end. They're both crises. Does that sound think, does, that, does that sound in the right no, area? That's absolutely right. And I think from my point of view, as a psychiatrist, obviously, I want to dig down and keep going because you might find two people have a crisis when a partner is unfaithful and leaves them. And one of them has a crisis in their own self-confidence, thinking nobody will want me, they have low self-esteem. Whereas the other one might have something going back much more sinister, such mm. as um, they were adopted as a child, um, they were then moved around in various homes. So they've never had that security. And so they now feel like there's nobody there for them. That's a very different uh, interpretation of what they're experiencing and what's creating the crisis. 
So I think it's very important to dig down and say, what is it this person is experiencing and what it, put it into context within their life and Got see it. why that has constituted a crisis. So in a bit more detail, if you don't mind, Steve, give us, give us the sort of chimp crisis management model. If you like, let's 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 you know let's let's not be specific about the type of crisis, um, but actually let's let's keep it as a sort of professional crisis because that might be useful for listeners here. A you know a feeling that their career is 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 kind of rattled out of control for whatever reason is now impacting their lives, uh, you know, in a, in a significant way. What's the what's the what's the crisis management model that we should be okay. we should be trying to develop in our own minds. Because I've gone down the neuroscience route, and as I said, this is not for everyone. It's just mm. the way I operate, and if people resonate, great. We need to almost draw on a piece of paper. I like to get things out of our heads because it's very hard to keep things in your head. And so we know that therapeutically it's good to talk out and even better to write down. So I would draw three columns with someone in crisis and say, let's look at what your human brain is doing, the chimp brain is doing, and what your computer brain has got. So we're going to look at three different systems. Mm-hmm. Because the human system is going to say this, once we've accepted, which we'll do quite quickly in the human circuits, what has happened? What's the plan for moving forward? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what am I going to do? And what's the reality of moving forward? That's straightforward for the human. However, the human has to now manage the chimp system, which won't cope. So as I explained earlier, the chimp system is very likely to go into a, a meltdown and go through an emotional turmoil. And the job of the human is to accept that, not to fight it and try and rationalize it. That doesn't actually work because it's not a system that works with rationality. So it's almost like talking to someone in a foreign language and and saying, why don't they get it? It's just not listening. Yeah. Yeah. The the chimp can't listen. Yeah. So that's why you often say, no, I know I understand what's happened. And then the chimp says, but it's unfair. And they come again. And you can see literally the two systems. And the answer is don't battle with it because you won't win work with it Mm -hmm. the way we work with it is to give tlc let's accept that whatever is we're experiencing let's give ourselves tlc because if we know like at work a crisis happened with uh an unfairness is the probably the best example the chimp in all of us when unfairness happens is built to react we know chimpanzees do this um even monkeys do this they will react to unfairness so it's a primitive thing The big success here is the computer system for us, because what we can do there is use our human to program it with our values, with reality, with the truths of a situation, but also the fact the chimp needs to grieve and it may need to grieve a number of times. So I don't say stop. I say get it off your chest and talk it through. And under these three columns, I would write down you need to talk it out, you know, so get someone who's going to listen, who's going to understand, not judgmental. But someone who genuinely will understand you, that really helps our chimp system. Being understood is imperative to the chimp. It wants people to acknowledge what we've gone through and it wants them to understand why things happened they did. Um, And then the, the computer system brings in other things such as perspective. You know, we all know that uh, in a crisis situation, for example, in my world, which obviously is a psychiatrist, is not a happy world. These are not people that come to see me because they're happy. So therefore, I'm leading, I've got crises all the time of different kinds and different levels. And I know that one of the key points is, and I will, if I listen and understand that person's feedback, that will help immensely. I can also act to support them by, which the computer can do, to say these days will pass. And we all know they do. They feel like they won't. The key is, this is not great news, but I'll keep going. Uh, We do get emotional scars. And these will raise their heads. So it's unrealistic to think the brain will heal because you won't heal. So I can give an example. I'm working with um, some parents who lost their child, uh, died in his sleep, um, and they will not recover this. I don't think it's fair to say you'll come to terms with it. None of that's going to happen. They're scarred for life. It's a permanent scar. What I can say is if we accept that and we start learning how to manage that scar when it raises its head, and we learn different ways of managing it and which is the most appropriate on the day it does, then life can get better and we can get good days, but we'll also have some really tough days. So that's the way I approach things. So a crisis, whatever it is, I would look at what the human is saying rationally, accept and work with the emotions we've got to work through, and then look at the computer system to give us our perspective on things. 
uh, and to reinforce a reminder to the chimp, especially when we're sleeping, but also to accept there may be an emotional scar from this. And it will come back to haunt us occasionally. We just need to recognize it is haunting us. It's not actually happening to us again. Right. What it, using that example that you gave, that sad example, what, what's yeah. the what's the what's the advice that then flows out of that? So when that moment, when that scar flares up again or opens up again, yeah. uh, what what are you saying to those parents that they should do to try and manage their way through those through that moment? OK, so if they're accepting, it will raise its head again. And I think those of us who have emotional scars know whatever we do, the brain will throw these up. It's not us thinking it and it's no good suppressing it. It doesn't work. Hmm. But we know this. So, so the answer is two, two tracks can be done initially. One is to sit down and talk it through again, you know, relive it, because each time we relive it, it does help us to start coming to terms with it. Uh, and particularly specific moments that we want to say, right, let's review that again. Let's see it differently. And also to put it into the past. It's not happening at the moment. So we would talk this through. And again, if people are struggling, they really ought to work with a specialist, which is usually a grief counsellor. It's often a psychologist who specialised and they will do this perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, so we help people. Alternatively, there are days where you think, you know what? I don't want to engage this scar and we are able to say, I acknowledge it. I'm not suppressing it, but I'm going to say, I'm going to just park it up because I want to just distract and get on with the day. And actually just by distracting, it may settle down again. So it's, it's learning which approach to use on which day. So den- denial has its place. That's not denial. Denial is when we refuse to accept. So if you notice, I said, accept it happened, yeah. but we'll park it up. So that's not denial. Parking. It's saying we're parking it up. We're going to say there's no point engaging it at the moment because mm. it's not going to do me any good. Mm. You know? And at this point, I don't feel I need to engage it. What I feel I need to do is accept mm. it there and I'm scarred. Let me get on and see if I can work past it. And if I can't, yeah. I'll come back to it. It's interesting. I use the word denial because our first guest, uh, not our first guest, one of our first guests, Martha, Baroness Martha Lane Fox, she had a, an awful car accident that, that almost claimed her life. And she still carries the injuries uh, from, that, uh, from that accident. And she said that she puts denial to work. She said that she will have days where she just doesn't want to. And it's not denial, actually. It's, it's exactly what you've explained. Yeah. It's because she's totally accepting of what happened to her. She parks it, but she might park it for a period of time and just not let it in at all. And that that will get her through. And other times she'll take a, she'll take a different, she'll take a different approach. And I think, I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? Is that exactly. it's, 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 exactly it's, it's right. just, but, but in, in, in the center of it is understand that it happened. Never forget that it happened. Yeah but choose your response according to where you are and how you feel at the time. Exactly. And that's a skill to do. And and sometimes like as a doctor, I may be able to help them to learn how to make those decisions. When is it appropriate to accept Mm. and put it on a, on a back burner or when is it appropriate to say, no, come on, let's get this out and talk about it again. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And then process it. So it's not just talking about it. It's talking about it and revisiting it. So we can add some rationality to it. Yes. Great. Crisis, of course, can bend um, our relationships out of shape, um, can cause real fractures in friendships and families. Um, there's one particular insight in your book, Steve, that I've carried with me in the notes on my uh, on my phone for a number of years now. This idea that you need to identify your own troop uh, and look after it, family and friends that really matter, but also to accept that there'll always be people who don't much care for you. Yeah. Uh, and that's just fine. Uh, you, you say, in fact, uh, 20% of, of people that you'll meet, you know, will love you. 60% yeah. will approve, but don't really have an especially strong view. Uh, and 20% won't like you at all, no matter what you do or say. And that feels about right to me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I make these figures up based on the, some research, but also... That's what, that was my question, actually. Uh, having carried it around with me for a while, I'm intrigued to know how you got to those, how you got to those numbers. Yeah, I mean, there is research to show that um, personalities can clash uh, and it's the way we look at our values, to be honest. Um, And therefore, if you think about this, if we know there are psychopathic individuals, we will never really get on with them unless they're using us. And then we'll feel awful when we realise that they didn't have our values. Mm. So when you start looking at this, I tried to make it simple. Otherwise, we can't apply it. But the principle is there to say we all know this. But it's worth reminding ourselves that there are a significant number of people out there who are not pleasant people. 
and, and all they want to do is undermine. It's often the same people that don't like all of us. Um, they will be very happy. Like social media is a good example. We meet very unsavory people who are out to destroy and criticize and be unpleasant. And they say, almost take a pleasure in this. Uh, mm. And it's no point in listening to them. The good guys, as I'm calling them, and the good guys are the ones who don't want us, uh, you know, to go unaccountable, but they want to be on side. They want us to say, look, we love you. you. People make mistakes or people get things wrong. Or even if you do one of these programs where I, I don't watch them, but um, they sing and people just criticize and, and you just think at the end of the day, they're doing their best. So I think if you recognize that, then it helps you to remember they're often the silent people. The mm. people who are proving of us tell, tell not to tell us this. Yes. Can I just say, in case we stray from this, I put this in the book. Um, when I wrote The Chimp Paradox, I, I gave a concept or an idea, and a lot of people said to me after, it doesn't go into depth. So I think it's important, especially in this interview, that we've talked of grief and the stages and, and processing. That's in the follow-up book, A Path Through the Jungle. Yes, I want to talk about that now, because I want to talk yeah. about, I want to talk about the stress. Because it's the detail in The yeah. Chimp Paradox. Yeah, so the, so the, 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 the Path Through the Jungle is is that almost it, it feels to me like the manual that sits behind um, the chimp paradox in a way. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the Haynes, it's the Haynes manual to the brain, I think. Um, uh, and it's got brilliant, brilliant stuff in it. Uh, one, one aspect, you talk quite a lot about stress. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in stress. I've, I've, I've held to the view again, because of the various experiences that I've had that stress was very helpful to me. Um, p- partly, I think, because I've done some reasonably stressful jobs, you know, as a, as a newspaper editor and then, and then in politics. And so I felt when, when things started to unravel for me that, uh, that my stress muscles were well exercised. That's how I sort of visualized it, really, as a, as a, as a muscle. Um, uh, was, was I delusional <laughs> in, no, think, I mean, in yeah. thinking that? Is stress, is stress a muscle? You know, can you train yourself to be stress fit? I think you're psychologically training yourself. And I think this is the problem when you write books. And that's why I do a lot of public speaking to explain the devil in the detail is when we use the word stress, it's not a negative thing. It's only stressful if we move to what I've called the stress stage, where we're stuck in this position where we've got a lot of negative hormones and chemicals uh, going through us and we're in a bad place. And we all understand that. But the initial point of stress is to wake us up and say, do something about it. And I explained within the path through the jungle that we do have a resilience hormone kicks in and it actually drops above the cortisol to sort of quash it down. And at that point, if we move into a plan of action and recognize stress is actually a helpful thing a lot of the time, then the cortisol levels drop and we don't do any damage to our system. The problem is if we don't recognize that that resilience moment is in front of us, then we know scientifically that cortisol starts to rise again and overpowers this DHEA hormone. So what I'm trying to say to people is, yeah, don't not welcome stress. It's part of life. But when it does hit, pause, put the pause button and say, right, what's the plan? And start moving with the hormones that are helping you to give you that energy. And I think what you've done, what you've described, and I'm guessing here, is you've learned that when that resilient stage comes in, you're optimizing that hormone, which is dropping your cortisol and actually energizing you. And it's of interest that a cortisol and noradrenaline are the two chemicals we talk about hormones that tend to be there in stress and can be damaging. But noradrenaline is peculiar in that in short bursts, it's actually very good for us. In long term, it's not good for us. So it's noradrenaline that we release when we go on a big dipper and it gives us that alert, lively feeling. It's a thrill. It's serious, you know, stress, but it's great stress. However, noradrenaline keeps going if we don't resolve a problem in our life uh, and that can create damage to the system. So, again, I'm trying to educate people within the book to say, have a look at this and welcome stress. Don't start thinking it's terrible. Think, what do I do with this? Yeah, I mean the, fact, the fashion. The fashion at the moment is to avoid it, right? Not just not just to see it as a bad thing. Well, we, I you think know, if, if you spend, you know, if you, you only got to spend an hour on Instagram these days, uh, or, or or any other social media, and and the, and the and the and the fashion is very much about you know uh, avoidance, and uh, uh, particularly in the workplace as well now. I think my my, two... my question, I suppose, is, is is a certain amount of stress actually a good thing for us? Should we be 
not just uh, uh, dealing with it in the way that you've described when it comes, but perhaps even seeking it out, making it a part That's of That's why I've put in the book, um, there are three stages. The first stage is not of importance in terms of health or well-being. It is the stress that comes in initially, an initial stress. No one's trying to avoid that. I don't think that's what we're talking about because we get that every day. If you get an email that says, please respond in 10 minutes, then you will get a flush of Mm. of stress hormones. But that's not stress. I think what we're all talking about is going from that first stage to the second to resilience, missing the resilience to go back to stage one and out of it. We drop into stage three, which I'm causing the stress stage. Everyone's trying to avoid that because I agree as a doctor, that is dangerous and unhelpful. It can be extremely damaging to our system. So so what you're saying quite rightly is initial stress is neither here nor there. It's what we do with it within it once it's appeared. What we can't do is miss the resilience stage and end up in a stressed state which is now not stress. It's a stress state. Yes, so it's I a stage it. that's damaging. But the initial belt of cortisol and noradrenaline, it, it won't do any harm. In fact, it tunes us up. So you're right in what you're saying. It tunes us up and you've moved into that resilient stage and optimise it. So that's your stress muscle. You've learned a system of how to go into stage two, turn it over and think that was productive. Yeah, great. Um, we touched on social media. Um, are you concerned, Steve, that we're that the sort of drive of, of technology, social media uh, uh, being one element of it, is sort of playing into the hands of our chimp, if you like? Yeah, I am concerned. I think um, the biggest concern is this. For me, is this? I there'll always be unpleasant people, but it's almost like we're influencing the middle group to start being highly critical. Um, very suspicious and then as a chimp brain does goes on its intuition which is often wrong uh, and then putting things together in such a way that is so negative uh, and so wrong uh, and then damage is done to people so you can see on the internet where some are overt criticisms but some are allegations innuendo and suggestion and and that's it's almost in my opinion it's quite evil because there is no way for you to defend yourself against an opinion you can't do anything with that. So therefore, if you engage with it, which a lot of people do, it will create horrendous stress of a very unhealthy nature. And mm. for young people who are on the internet all the time and doing social media, this can be extremely destructive because during the ages of around 12 to about 17, we're mm. extremely suggestible in terms of our, you mentioned the troop earlier, uh, it's critical that we're accepted within a group. To be rejected from a group or by a close friend or to be criticised publicly uh, is horrendously damaging to the brain. Uh, we will find brain changes. So, and we see this in younger children as well. Just, just explain that in a little bit more detail for us. How, how, does, how does that damage actually kind of occur and how does it manifest itself? Okay, when the, the brain picks up information... At the orbital frontal area, which I'm saying is the thinking part of the chimp, we know that it specifically has one function, and that is to be socially accepted. So it's a primitive defense to stay within the troop, as a chimpanzee would. And as humans, we do the same. We like to be within our circle. So we like to be accepted. We know that if that part gets damaged, say with a bleed, for example, a stroke, and that part is damaged, people start losing that and are not bothered. And they'll create social faux pas. They're not aware that people might be laughing at them or think that's inappropriate comment. So they make these inappropriate comments because they're no longer in that position where they need to be accepted. Mm. So in young children, particularly where these, the brain is developing, um, this part of the brain, if it gets rejected from a group, then it files that in the rest of the brain. It actually puts it in as being I am going to be rejected. Uh, or I'm now vulnerable. And we know that a part of the brain just next to this, the ventromedial area in young people doesn't actually develop. So this rejection by their group inhibits that from developing so that it can't function later in life. It has a window to develop. And once that is damaged, then it tends to make us more nervous and jittery later in life. 
So we know that being rejected by the group or being criticized on social media or in the press, as we've seen, if the press go for someone and it's not justified, particularly it's not justified, then what happens is that person will get damage to the system. And so there is therefore a residual damage to the emotions and scars, and it takes a lot to turn that over. So what do we do about this, Steve? I mean, for, in terms of if we just focus on young people. Um... I mean, it's a culture change that we need to make to start being more uh, complimentary about things and also trying to train people in the middle group. And we'll never stop people who are unpleasant doing it. We'll never stop that. Mm. You know, uh, the middle group needs to be influenced to say, do you realise the damage that's being done? You know, what are you doing to these people when you make these adverse comments and remarks and, you know, so your, 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 your view is that the answer has to lie in behavioral change. It can't, we can't, we, the, the technological also is bolted to mix my metaphors. You're, um, you know, you, 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 we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to do anything about that. What we possibly can do is, is bring some behavioral change into play. Yeah, because again, most people, I could say in my made up stat of 80% to say, this is roughly where we're at. Uh, do not want to hurt somebody. We have a conscience and a moral, and we the last thing we want to do is, is be dishonest, lack integrity, be not empathic. We want to be all these things. So why would we then put these comments on? Mm. Uh, and it could be, I don't know the stats enough to know that these 80% are actually against the rest of them. We've got 20% doing all the vo vocalising, but that 20% are creating the damage. But if we can actually say, as a, as a human being, as a force, we can say, look, it's unacceptable behaviour and reflect it back to those who are doing it. Then we have a measure of control to say there are consequences to you doing this because we're going to expose the people who keep doing this because yeah. they're damaging other people. Yeah. Do you see the chimp at play in politics? Have you ever been tempted to offer your services in Westminster? I I, personally, I take the view that you should have a permanent office there, maybe, <laughs> maybe in number 10. You know, I'd love to. But maybe a desk next to, to the do. Prime Minister. I'm not sure I'd do a good job. Uh, again, I don't tell people what to do. I ask them to explore what they're doing. It's a serious um, point, though, isn't it? I mean, if you, the change that you've just described we need to make, it can only come, in the first instance, through public life, right? Yeah, and obviously I'm doing what I can. I do a lot of public speaking. I do a lot of work now with schools, and uh, my team does. Uh, and we're going up there trying to turn the tide, but it's a big tide. Um, yeah, I mean, it'd be great if at the top people would look and say, particularly for me, it's a passion that we bring this into schools. So we start at a young age to say, let's look at what you're doing to people and the way our behaviours and conduct affect others and society. I think that's, to me, the crucial yeah. uh, alongside all the other activities that we teach young people. But I've, I'm only one voice. I'm sure. But, I mean, you've worked, you've worked. Let, in fact, let's, let's talk about it very quickly. Your work, your work in sport, because it's fascinating. Um, British cycling during the golden period under David Browsford, uh, numerous, you know, highly successful athletes, Liverpool Football Club and, of course, England, the England football team. Tell us how it works, Steve, when you walk into, well, let's take the England setup, for example. When you walk into a, you know, a room full of very talented uh, uh, young footballers who are, you know, successful, wealthy, but underperforming, uh, what, 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 what's going on in the minds uh, there of those of those young athletes and how do you approach it with them? okay first is i respect the fact that the most important is their physical skills and the talents employed and, and their tactics and so on that, that isn't my domain so i always go in um hopefully in a humble way and say to them all i can offer is to say let's look at how your mind is functioning do you believe it's working optimally and if it isn't can I show you how to gain those emotional skills? But if you think I'm operating well as I am, then there is no role for me to play. Mm. I don't come in and say, these are the processes. What I do is ask individual people, regardless of whether it's football, whether it's cycling, whether it's a professional business, a doctor, a, a teacher, I ask them, let's look at scenarios where it, your mind isn't doing what you want it to. You've not got the behaviors you want, you're not operating uh, with the thinking that you want. And then we look at that and get the person in a good place. My philosophy is always the same. Don't tell me what you do until we find out who you are, how you function, how you want to function and get your skill base. Then take me to your workplace. And I do that in sports. So I work with the person first. Then they tell me what their sports are and what's, how their machine is operating within that sport. Okay. And do you focus on the points of pressure as well? I mean, obviously with England, 
I'm sure you've been asked this question a thousand times. What's going on in the mind of an England footballer when he takes a penalty in a, in a yeah, cup final? Yeah. I, I, only, I only offer services when I'm invited. So if I work with a team and they say, no, we're OK on this, then it's not my role to, to go in and do it. I can challenge and say, would it help? But if I'm told, well, no, it won't help, then obviously I wouldn't impose. If they say it might help, then I go to individual players to say, would you like to do it? So no, sure, you, sure. as a psych, I think this is only where I operate. Your hands are tied on the person in front of you because that's how it should be. I'm a minion in the game. I'm not the leader. The leader is the person. All I can do is then support them. And if they work well with me, great. If it's not for them, great. Steve, look, I, I think your formula for a happy life is, 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 is about the best I've read, uh, which if, if I'm summarising this correctly, I hope I do. Um, you know, make healthy plans that that counter these primal urges that you've described. Um, let yourself kind of vent in a safe space, if you like. Get it off your chest. Yeah. Uh, communicate as much as you can with wisdom and love, and celebrate all your successes along the way. I think that's. Yeah, a, I like that. I think that's a piece of genius. Yeah. I, hope, I hope I've. I hope it's I've got simple, it. Simple, really. I hope I've got it about right. It does sound wonderfully simple. No, no, it does. Oh, that it was. It but I mean, it's as a guiding light. I think it's. Um, I think it's. I think it's just fantastic. Look, I can't tell you how grateful I am for you joining us today. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for your insights. Before you. we go, I'd like to ask you for your um, your three crisis cures. Um, these are th- three things that have kind of that, that you me, that you that you think- keep in mind. Yeah, if I hit something which is creating some form of what people might call crisis in my life, there are three things I turn to. The most important for me is my values. So I do actually stop, uh, get myself on my own and think, okay, have you done the right thing? Have you got integrity? Have you got honesty? Are you working with compassion? I go through this. If I know that to be true, I can't stop the world thinking what it thinks. So therefore, whatever the crisis is, that helps me when it's you're thrown around. Um, if it's something where there's been an incident, um, such as the boat incident uh, or something tragic happens and it creates a crisis, my second one is to learn as a skill to accept a situation as soon as I can uh, so that I can work forward with the situation rather than fighting the situation or the injustice or uh, you know, the crisis that's happened, the, the incident. So acceptance is number two. Uh, and finally, is perspective. Uh, at the end of the day, we have very short lives. Um, and, and I didn't used to think that as a young man. Now I'm an old man. You think, wow, what happened? It just went. Uh, and you're, you're trying to get through your life and suddenly it's disappeared. So perspective for me is really crucial for maintaining uh, a status quo within my mind and, and giving me peace of mind. Wonderful. Steve, thanks so much for your time today. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.